All right, guys, we're going to get started. Um, still people trickling in, but that's okay. Um, welcome to Targaryen Politics in Post Dragon Westeros. Uh, my name is Samantha Wallace. I'm a contributing writer to Watchers on the Wall. And I have to get this out there. I have never been on a panel before. This is the first time I've ever done anything like this. Woo! So you guys are my first. <laughs> Yeah. You never forget your first. You never panel. forget you your never first. first um, again, I'm Samantha, and we'll start. Uh, Steve, why don't we start down there with you? If yep. you, we all want to introduce ourselves. Uh, I'm Steve Love. I'm an actor, comedian, YouTuber. Some of you may know me. I was on Game of Thrones one time. I got finger blasted in the butthole and decapitated <laughs> by the hound. So it's okay. That was awesome. I know, right? <laughs> Thank you. You can't die better than that. No, I couldn't have asked for a better cameo. Yeah. I was like, hey, guys, can you give me a death? And they're like, oh, oh don't worry. We've got, <laughs> we've got just the thing for you, Steve. Hi, I'm Aziz. Um, I'm with the podcast and YouTube show History of Westeros, and uh, we focus on backstory and parallels to the current story. And uh, so this is a great topic I'm excited to talk about with y'all. Yeah. Uh, I'm Jim McGeehan, uh, commonly called something like a lawyer. I work for, right for worlds and, Wars and Politics of Ice and Fire, so this is also something that I uh, focus on significantly. Um, I came up with this panel as soon as Sue asked for ideas for panels. I'm like, this is actually something I've always wanted to talk about, and this is the greatest uh, setting that I could talk about it at. Right on. So yeah. the big thing is, is that Aegon the Conqueror forged a monarchy of dragon, draconic power. There's only one problem, that about 150 years into it, the last dragon died. So what are you left with? Not much, really. You've got, uh, it took kind of took people a while to figure out they had been kind of uh, conditioned to never even consider, for the most part, there's always exceptions, rebelling against that, because how are you going to beat the dragons? But as once the dragons died out, people started to get the idea that the Targaryens weren't as powerful as they used to be. Combine that with some pretty poor kingship, and you get uh, a lot of uh, problems and civil wars and such. Um, do you guys want to? Do we want to give a like a brief timeline? Is everybody familiar with kind of like the the backstory to how uh, to to the king leading up to when the, the last dragon died? Okay. Quick refresher? Um, well, well, okay, yeah, we'll do a very quick refresher. So a little bit of background here. Um, the, I, I guess the, the death of the dragons is kind of go, can start, can be said it starts with the, the Dance of the Dragons. Yes. Because there mm -hmm. were a bunch of dragons. That, the Dance of the Dragons, in case nobody knows, is big civil war between two different Targaryens. Um, and the dragon pit in King's Landing was stormed, and actually a bunch of dragons were killed. Mm -hmm. um, so it kind of sort of starts there. Um, and then it really, I mean, it officially comes to an end with the reign of Aegon III, um, which was back in, I think, 131 to like 157 AC or something like that. Um, but the last dragon dies during his reign, and he's known as the Dragon Bane, not necessarily because the last dragon dies during his reign, but also because he really had an aversion to dragons. Um, so I think maybe he was secretly a little pleased that there were, that there were no more um, dragons. Um, but that's kind of where it. Uh, that's kind of where the death of the dragons happens, and where we're gonna uh, go. Are forward we allowed to say why here. he didn't like dragons? Yes, oh, absolutely. Yes, His it. mother was cooked and eaten by a dragon. Yes, mm -hmm. right in front of him. I think that yeah. would turn me off of dragons. Yes, yeah. and not only that, he was he was young too, like. Uh, Five or yeah, six. Five yeah. or six when that yeah. happened. So kind of a formative period of his life. He also had his own dragon die under him while escaping a really uh, yeah. A yeah. battle. He and, escaped uh, a sea battle and on uh, his, his dragon, his, his dragon flying yeah. pushed him pretty much to Dragonstone, and then the dragon died of exertion, overexertion. Yeah. Poor, so, poor yeah. thing, little guy. Yeah. But, uh, but he, poor little it's, guy. It's, and it's true that he was kind of afraid of dragons, as you can see. This is true for why, but mm -hmm. uh, he still made attempts to hatch eggs because Correct. he recognized how important they were even though he had this fear yeah. of them. So that tells you a lot that yeah. Yeah. It, how important it was for their, uh, their regime to continue. Um, yeah, so the dragons were the foundation of Targaryen power. So even if you don't like dragons, you kind of need them in order to actually enforce your power. Monarchy is very dependent upon being able to project force from the person and, power, uh, person and state of the king. So Aegon had to come up with an idea as to what does the monarchy actually mean? And he actually has a quote. He's one of the few that actually gives us a quote when he dismissed his council of regents, which was full of infighting and politicking and 
you can almost guess that George has actually cooked up a whole complicated mess of stuff just be, from all of the little hints that he gave, such as uh, the hand of the king storming the tower where the king and the prince were actually at, which begs a couple of questions. Um, but he says, uh, "With how about we send Mushroom on a progress? I have found nothing more that the, the small folk like than fools. Or dancing bears. <laughs> Full bellies and dancing bears. That will be my... My reign. So he says that he came into the monarchy at a very troubled time, a very disastrous civil war, and then followed by a lot of instability at the top elsewise. So he says, I'm going to project strength through, it sounds like bread and circuses, but it's not as cynical as what Juvenal was talking about in Rome. He was actually saying, I'm going to provide bread and entertainment for the people, and hopefully that will say, things are calm and stable now. Mm -hmm. That is what I'm going to say that the monarchy is, is a bringer of stability. And under his reign, it, it was pretty stable. Mm -hmm. As we said, there wasn't a lot of people who would, uh, there wasn't a lot of opportunity to rebel just yet. The Dance of Dragons ripped the realm apart, so no one was terribly eager to get back to war again, mm -hmm. dragons or no. And uh, his, so his reign was fine, and we have the next reign would have been uh, Darren, 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 yeah. Darren the, young, the, the young dragon. The young dragon. I'm going to invade Dorne. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, interestingly, he succeeded where all the attempts with dragons failed. Because kind of. It kind didn't, of. It didn't yeah. last, but yeah, yeah he, he succeeded. It just didn't take. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was a short-lived success. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So and, uh, the dragons yeah. probably wouldn't have done a wouldn't yeah. have helped with that a whole lot. Right? But what he, I what okay. I always thought was interesting about that because you know Darren, um, I think he did. He thinks of it as like he thought of it as like unfinished business on the part of his ancestors. Right. He really, yeah. you know, because that since Egg and the Conqueror, they had been trying to bring Dorne into the fold, and it hadn't happened. And Dorne had been very, you know, resisted the whole time. Um, so, you know, Darren was like unfinished business. I'm going to make it happen, and he kind of sort of did. But I've always thought of that as, you know, I mean, he was kind of like this young impetuous king anyway. Mm -hmm. But I've always thought of that as kind of like a PR move on his part. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like um, Egg and the Third, you know, he had kind of a good idea with like trying to, you know make everything stable, keep everybody entertained, keep everybody fed, keep everybody happy. But Darren, I think, was really eager to, to show that uh, House Targaryen still had a lot of strength and a lot of might and power behind it, dragons or no. Um, and I wonder if he still would have attempted the <laughs> invading Dorn if he had dragons. Part of me saying it's a, thinks yes, definitely, because he was he still, was again, yeah, he yeah. still was that kind of guy. But I've always thought of that as a, definitely a, a PR move on his part to really kind of drive it home for the people of Westeros. Like, we're still mighty uh, without our dragons. That's a good but. point, because it, it kind of backfired, because yeah. at first it was like, oh, wow, they did it. He took Dorne mm -hmm. without dragons, and then a few years later, oh. Not so much. Well, he didn't, really. Yeah. He's but dead, also, and so are some other people. Also, <laughs> a big thing is that he really actually built a large military alliance in order to, to complete his conquest of Dorne. Uh, you saw that he was actually best friends with Rickon Stark, son of Cregan Stark. Uh, obviously, the Reach were very invested in the conquest of Dorne, given that they were going to be the viceroys of Dorne. Uh, but you really got to see a big sense of this large military alliance with the Targaryens at the head of. And that was the, tar the Daron the first idea of a power of what the Targaryen monarchy was going to be, a military power with themselves at the head as general in the, in the, way, in the vein of a martial aristocracy that Westeros is. So after Daron, we have Baylor the Blessed, who you could say is uh, a little bit the opposite, maybe. <laughs> he's a little, a little more bit. peaceful. He is like, he's more of the. Uh, I'm gonna just. I'm just. If, if there's an issue, I'm just gonna fast about it. <laughs> <laughs> the best solution is to just which, not. Eat. Yeah. Which so, <laughs> did not end well for him. His last no, fast, yeah. anyway. It did end for it, him. It did. <laughs> but <laughs> even he, even though he didn't believe in the old. Targaryen, Valyrian religion, none of that was for him. He believed in the seven. He was devout as, as they come. Even he tried to get his eggs hatched by, by praying over them, which mm -hmm. predictably didn't work. But even he, even yep. he. Yeah. It's, and that, Nick, it's, and that just goes to, yeah. Important. Mm -hmm. It just goes to show you how, how much stock that Targaryens put in, in their dragons mm -hmm. when you had someone like the Egg and the Third who was scared of them and hated them. And then you had Baylor the Blessed who was, again, super peace Nick, really, you know, mm -hmm. and they still were trying to, to make these dragon eggs hatch. So it's interesting. It's really for the best that uh, Baylor the Blessed didn't produce any uh, offspring because <laughs> because then Viserys II doesn't become king and then you don't get Aegon the Unworthy who's really <laughs> the best king. Like, well, that's, yeah. As really indicated by his name. He's yeah. Robert Baratheon on steroids. He's my favorite <laughs> king. Yeah. Really? Yeah. 
Yeah. No, he's not. But, yeah, so, so, he, so he, he made the most interesting story. Yeah. So so Baylor actually had his his idea was kind of the the the, the faith was going to unite the uh, the monarch uh, the uh, the realm with the monarch as the head. This was actually something that happened a lot in the Middle Ages. Uh, the Byzantine Empire, for example, with its doctrine of Caesar Papism. Caesar. Over I love Pape. that word, by the way. Uh, I really Caesar wanted papism. to hear you talk about Caesar, that. Caesar, Caesar, Caesar of Papism. Caesar. Uh, because the Byzantine emperors were very, very powerful when it came to influencing the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople, who was the religious head of the Eastern Orthodox uh, uh, sect of Christianity. Um, you also had the same thing with the Pope actually trying to become the spiritual head of the West of the realms of uh, Western Europe, and that worked to varying degrees of success, especially when your name was Kaiser Henrik IV, who decided that <laughs> I'm going to go and appoint, appoint bis bishops because I'm the Kaiser. <laughs> so it's kind of like they're replacing the power of dragons with the power of the gods. They're saying, well, yeah. we don't have dragons, but the yeah. gods are on our side. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. better, even. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah so, I mean, even the, really the, the, Muslim, uh, the Muslim caliphates in the Middle Ages, they, the head of state was actually the, also the head of the religion. That was actually a, a foundational uh, tenet of Islam from, from the get-go uh, was the idea of the caliph, uh, caliph sorry, as the uh, spiritual and secular head of the various uh, Muslim regions such as the Abbasids, the Umayyads, uh, the Fatimids, and so on and so forth. And Baylor was a super drastic pivot away from yes. Darren, obviously. You know, Darren was was aggressive and, you know, um, uh, more war focused, I, I would think. Yeah. And they were brothers. Um, you can kind of see, like, you know, brothers kind yeah. of going complete opposite directions. You know, <laughs> yeah. Kind of, that's a normal thing. Mm -hmm. But I wonder, I, something that I've always thought about is I like, I wonder if it was for the best that Baylor assumed the throne um, because Darren was, again, you know, kind of aggressive and, you know, war focused. Um, and wars tend to drag down the popularity of a ruler. You know what I mean? And I can uh, definitely see the young dragon wanting to explore other conflicts and like drag them out and everything. Well, actually, um, wars don't necessarily drag down the popular popularity of a, of a, of a medieval I think medieval they can role. if they go Losing on long enough. Losing wars. Well, yes. Losing yeah. wars yeah. is what... But I think if they go on did, long yes, enough, that, they're yeah. expensive well, well, and people die. He actually won the war, but he and he was killed in a peace conference, which at... Yeah. For the irony. Westeros is actually kind of... That was that, taboo, That's actually very a very taboo. big taboo. That's yeah. violating guest right. I mean, yeah, you can yeah. see with the phrase... It didn't sit well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. with the phrase... The, I mean, even, even the Lannisters who benefited from the Red Wedding, everyone's like, listen, you have to punish the phrase for that. <laughs> you can't just not let that slide. Um, and, you know, that that is really a big thing. And, and that, it's interesting, too, because Baylor is remembered very differently. Like you yes. said, he like she said, he's very po he was very popular with the commons, mm -hmm. yes. even though some of his policies were totally nuts. Yeah, the small folk uh, loved him. But they loved him. And he was, yeah. you know, a generous guy that did a lot of things that you wouldn't see a king do. But I wonder how much of that was actually like they loved him during his reign or they kind yeah. of remember the guy he was after that. Like, I think I'm pretty so. sure, yeah. I'm pretty sure a lot, lot of, of the small folk didn't like the part where he tried to outlaw prostitution. Probably not. Probably no, not. they were probably very but unhappy with that. Like Sansa in like one of her early chapters yes. is, talks about Baylor was great. You yeah. Know? yeah. He was, he was, he was so wonderful because right. so yeah. he built the sept and they made songs about his piety. Yeah. 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 He was First always, didn't he, he like emptied the treasury like wanting to, you know, take care of the small folk. Locked his sisters in a vault. Yes. Everybody loved that. Everybody loved that except for the sisters. <laughs> Actually, nobody yeah, liked that. Oh, yeah. don't tempt me, and sisters. And that's a good segue. We have uh, actually behind all this, the hand of the king throughout all these reigns. Yes. These last three reigns was the same guy. This was Viserys II, who we just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And Viserys was part of keeping these th these things from running off mm -hmm. the rails. He helped Daron's wars not go go bad not go as badly as they might have. Well he handled the domestic reigns. Right, he helped sorry, he helped yeah. domestic while the war was going on and then he kept Baylor from screwing everything up too badly. Mm -hmm. And, and, and may have okay. killed him, may have poisoned him. That's a whole other topic. But yeah. uh But we'll there it is actually a Kings were often chronic bankrupts in the Middle Ages. This was actually, it was very, very common for a king to go, or a monarchy to go bankrupt. The fact that Viserys II kept his kingdom in the black through Daron's war, Baylor emptying the treasury, treasury for his charitable acts, that's actually fairly remarkable. It's, it's unheard of for someone to be that good of, you know, a steward and statesman to be able to could keep all of that going. I'm guessing that because he was raised in Essos, he probably understood trade a lot better than most Westerosi monarchs yeah, typically do. He was raised yeah. by bankers. Yeah. Um, so he actually probably really understood that. And also, 
probably had a lot of just personal ties to rule, you know, Rega- I mean, the Regari Bank kind of dwindled in importance after the Regari Spring and the most of them getting assassinated by, great parallel by the faceless men. Uh, Tywin because he, yeah. he, he, yeah. he lost his my kind of, he's, he lost his wife really early and he had a lot of responsibility thrust on him at like yeah. age 18. He was handed the king yeah. by roughly the same age as Tywin was and, and yeah. had the job for a long time and, and uh, while well, the kings were bad. The best non-sept in <laughs> Barth hand. Yeah. <laughs> and, he, and then so then from Viserys but Viserys was only king for uh, a a less year, than a year. Less yeah. than a year. But he had a vision though because you even said as soon as he took the throne he had this idea of a grand bureaucratic state with the Targaryen as the head of it. Sort of an administrator in chief. So rather than the big showy moments of Daron the First or Baylor, he was all about I am going to build a functioning, worthwhile monarchy, very similar to the way that uh, Aegon the Third did. But even Viserys the Second, for as as unpersonable as he was, he was actually quite personal in his younger years. But I mean, you look at the Amok picture of him, and he his middle name looks like Buzzkill. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> But he really had this idea of a functioning state. And that's, I mean, a lot of centralizing kings was a little bit further in the, to the late Middle Ages rather than where uh, the equivalent of where Westeros would be at. But uh, the, the model I see for him is Le Roi de Fer, Louis the Fair, or the Iron King, as he was called, because he expelled, he, he was the one that killed the Knights Templar. Yep. He was the one mm-hmm. that conquered uh, Flanders. He did a lot of, not necessarily great stuff, but he did centralize the monarchy, the French monarchy, in um, I think it was the 1400s. Was when 1300s, I think. Late 1300s? I think so. I think so. Um, yeah, no, I know it was because 1402 was Bannock, uh, uh, Golden Spurs. So. I'm going to have to take your word for it on this one, guys. Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> so, so in the <laughs> late 1300s, early 1400s, Le Roi de Fer tried to centralize the French monarchy, and that's the model I look to when I see. Yeah. He, he second. kind of permanently restructured the, the nobility. Now, this in, in terms of French history and European history, this was huge. But in yeah. Viserys' case, George was like, hey, these are interesting reforms, but it doesn't make for as great of a story. So this guy's going to die. Yeah. And yeah. we're going to replace him with his son, who is going to have a whole lot of bastards, and that's going to kick off a whole lot of stories and rebellions. Yep. And, uh, and, and a he big, all, meaty part yeah. of this panel. Another yes. shot. Another guy who tried to invade Dorne, this time we're talking about dragons. He literally built wooden dragons with wildfire. <laughs> we're in talking them, about uh, which is Egg in the Unworthy. Egg in the Unworthy, yeah. yes. Yeah. Tried to invade Dorne using uh, g- giant wooden dragons with wildfire in them, which is like carrying a nuke in a Fisher Price wheel. Like, <laughs> yeah, and then we hold it through the mountains. Like, yeah. It's like, yeah, he was going like to try and drag them through the mountains to Dorne. on oceans. Right. It's like, mm, this This can't possibly go wrong. Let's go yeah. and take this oh, yeah. through a tropical, or not a tropical, a temperate forest called the Kingswood. I'm sure <laughs> nothing yeah, will go absolutely. wrong here. And he doesn't um, have the excuse of Ares of being insane. He was just kind of dumb. He was, yeah, yeah, he was definitely, <laughs> yeah. Um, like, no, Egan, so, I mean, everybody knows about Egg and the Unworthy. Raise your hand if you don't know about Egg and the Unworthy. Oh, yes, I'm oh, in the right room. Wow. Um, <laughs> Everybody's great in here. Well, one thing one thing that's interesting is like, I mean, b- before we even get more into t- talking about Egan the Unworthy, um, it's it's really interesting that from uh, Egan the Third to um, to Baylor to, to Darren, you know, all throughout this process of these last couple of Targaryen kings, it almost seems like each one of them is experimenting with a different type of yes. government. And in the and it's all post dragon. So in the absence of the dragons, it's yep. almost kind of like the Targaryens are trying to figure out what works. And a couple of times they almost get there. Um, and in a couple of cases, mm-hmm. it does. Viserys the second obviously did very well. Um, yeah, you know, keeping for the, the nine months he for was the in nine office. months he was in office. <laughs> you know, but it's interesting because yeah, it does seem like they're kind of trying to see what works. Yeah. Yeah. And they almost get the hang of it. And then to me, it seems like Egg and the Unworthy is one who just blows everything up. Yeah, he didn't. Uh, he didn't try to rule well. He did he, not. His, his, he, he didn't really try to rule. He just used the kingdom for his yeah. pleasure and yep. and ambitious, uh, cynical men would get close to him and promise yeah. him stuff. But it's interesting that, you know, like the the Targaryens were always, you know, when they had their dragons, I mean, they were called if you were a Targaryen who rode a dragon, you were a dragon lord. I mean, it was, you know, kind of this almost mythical status that Targaryens had when they had dragons. Mm -hmm. And then it was almost, you know, once all the dragons were gone, um, I feel like they kind of didn't know what they were doing at first. 
in yeah. terms of trying to to mm -hmm. know how to govern without that just automatic mm -hmm. power behind them of dragons. It's like, oh shit, what do we do now? Yep. So yeah. <laughs> they went through this this process of these couple Targaryen kings trying to figure it out, and yeah. each one was different. You'll notice that there was a rise in importance of other like dragons were kind of an obvious symbol of Targaryen power, and they weren't just a symbol; they were real power. But they were re replaced with things that were more symbolic, like. The Valyrian steel sword. Blackfire was obviously a huge part of the thing. Aegon the Conqueror's original crown was a big mm -hmm. deal. And little things like that. Those things became more important to emphasize those to show that their their power. And of course, like in Baylor's case, he, you know, emphasized his connection to the gods. But yeah, like uh like Michelle said, these things just didn't didn't work very well. Yeah. And then so Aegon decided to turn the monarchy into more of a symbol of it's going to be the the grantor of largesse if you can please him. <laughs> Uh, so, for example, Butterwell gives him all three uh, maiden daughters, and he gets a dragon egg. Whereas, you know, a couple generations back, a dragon egg was reserved only for the most royal of royals. I mean, even if, if you had, if you were a cousin of the Targaryens, if you got there, you got one. If there was one left yeah. for you, when um, Targaryen babies were born, they would put a dragon egg in the crib. Like yeah. that's what they were. That's how precious they were. And now, and now it's just given away to Butterwell for one night, one <laughs> one great night. Woo! Congratulations. Here well, is your dragon egg. In Egan's defense, he did do a pretty amazing feat that night and got all three of them pregnant in one night. He did. So. That, that is pretty impressive. I mean, does it merit a dragon egg? Maybe I not. I don't think but. so. But <laughs> no one's debating his fertility. <laughs> no one. Yes, no one is debating his his obvious fertility. Fecundity. Yeah, yes, that's there we go. Good word. Good yeah, word. much better word. I like that. Big so word. big word. But you also got to see the start of what actually would become the later idea of the Targaryen monarchy with Aegon the Fourth and with his son at this point, Crown Prince Daeron. Uh, where they started to champion factions. In Aegon the Fourth's case, he was really the champion of the anti-Dornish faction, the one who wanted to go back to war with Dorne. Um, a lot of there was a lot of uh, commonality between them. Aegon the Fourth was a veteran of the of Daeron's War of Dornish Conquest, so he probably had a lot of kinship with his fellow veterans, especially some of the older Targaryen or older Reach families that may have felt a little put out by the. Uh, by the Baylor's Pe uh, Peace Treaty, especially, f say, for example, the Oakharts, who had one of their members of the Kingsguard die during the, the peace conference. It's like they're never going to forgive the Targaryens for that. Or, sorry, the, uh, the Dornish, the Dornish yeah. for that, and then probably held a lot of anger towards Baylor for making a peace mm -hmm. with that. Whereas Crown Prince Daeron, who was married to uh, Maria, Maria Martell, Maria Martell. Uh, he would champion the pro-Dornish faction. So that obviously the Martells would be one of the biggest supporters for that, but there would also be other members who perhaps didn't want to go to war with Dorn for whatever reason. They did, maybe didn't feel it was profitable or in their best interest, or if they were just not going to get anything, we lose a bunch of you know, our, our fighting, uh, fighting men and we get nothing in return except for, hey, congrats, good job. I mean, that's, that's great, but someone still needs to go and uh, harvest the crops so that we can collect taxes on it. Um, so you get to see this idea of the king as a faction champion and faction head. And uh, Aegon kept courting it, and because of his disastrous two military campaigns, he made two campaigns with Dor uh, against Dorne. One was ru ruined by a storm, and the other was ruined by the fact that wooden dragons carrying wildfire are very volatile, and he burned down half the king's wood. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, I guess that's just, you know, they're all just, you know, mistakes. But eventually Aegon <laughs> died you know, horrible, horrible fashion. Yeah, yeah the things crawling in him and they couldn't, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, he had like flesh worms and things yeah. on him. It was just it was so, nasty, so nasty business. <laughs> yeah, just and disgusting. And had Daron the second, and unfortunately... And he still had a mistress at that point. Yes, still had a somehow, a brave, somehow. brave, and that was the that was the mistress with whom he created the the someone who Shiris Yostar, Shiris Yostar, who everyone called some, the most beautiful woman, one of the most beautiful women of her generation. Well, Serenay of so. Lys was considered one of the most yeah. beautiful women of her generation. Didn't get it yeah. from her father. Didn't, Didn't get, get it from, from her father. father. <laughs> Definitely not. But um, so then you have Crown Prince Daeron, and unfortunately, Daeron is exactly the opposite of what the martial aristocracy of Westeros is looking for. He was he was very frail. Very in very poor physical uh, condition. Very yeah, he had a little pot belly. He had a little pot belly, despite also having no no arms. <laughs> Scrawny. Um, and, he was, uh, and he was kept company with maesters yeah, he and liked septons. Maesters and singers and Dornish people, which yep. is the big yeah. Offensive. And he, he also he appointed a lot a lot of uh, women, a lot of female counselors to positions. Um, which even even a generation before, uh, what was her name? Elena Targaryen, Elena Targaryen mm -hmm. yeah. was. Very, very intelligent, uh, in, especially in matters of finance, but she could not rule officially. 
she was just basically had it. They had a shadow shadow master of coin who probably couldn't even count, and everyone just kind of accepted that Elena Targaryen was doing uh, doing it. But he was more yeah. overt in saying, "Well, you know, Dorne practices absolute primogeniture and gender neutral, um, you know, uh, political power. So I'm going to do the same thing." You could say he was progressive. Yeah, that that would be a, that would yeah. be a good word for it. A lot of people didn't like those particular types of progression, especially the Dornish stuff and yep. being peaceful. A lot of people didn't like that. Being so diplomatic, maybe. those that's not yeah. for us. No, that faction not. that was championed by Aegon the Fourth found a new champion in Damon Blackfire, who was Damon Blackfire was everything that the martial ideal wanted. First off, he was you know very physically fit, very capable with sword and lance. And here's one thing that I don't think people really do understand with. With the loss of Aegon I's crown in Dorne, which was lost at the peace treaty, and the loss of the dragons, which don't exist, the real symbol that they have left of Aegon the Conqueror is Blackfire. Blackfire. So yep. Damon Blackfire st- assumes a sort of heroic mythos of Aegon the Conqueror. And in a, especially a pre-literate society like medieval Westeros, that's, that symbolism is very important, especially to the small folk, which is why you can see why a lot of nobles and small folk alike really liked Damon Blackfire. And by all accounts, he actually seemed to practice what he preached. He yeah. was a very chivalrous, very yeah. polite person. And, he, and Egan and knighted him another, with Blackfire and then post, gave it to him. So. Another post-dragon symbol of, of the, yes. of the yeah. heraldry is his Valyrian features. He had yes. the silvery gray hair. He had the purple yeah, eyes. It was, he was yeah. sexy. He was hot. Yeah. Great point. Darren yeah. was, looked a Great little point. more And he was yeah. fertile. Dornish. He had seven kids yeah. by like age 26. Yeah. 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 That's, Five that's sons. That's considered very virtuous. You know, oh, so he had all these kind of... Oh, he's so kingly. <laughs> yeah, right. As a bastard, but he was targeted. Married at fast. 16, yeah. seven kids by 26. Oof. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's what the what's all I've always thought is interesting about the the egg and the unworthy years is, you know, the the really interesting notion about the factions. You know, the yes. king as as a faction head, as leader of kind of this group against that group. And any time that you think about medieval politics or anything monarchy centered, you know what I mean? You're always thinking, oh, well, there's always games being played at court and there's always, yes. and of course, even before Egan's mm-hmm. reign, there there was that happening. But this was like the most, I guess, blatant example of that. Yeah. Or when it really kind of became like these two strong factions against each other. And mm-hmm. it literally, you know, came to uh, actual armed conflict. Yeah. when the Blackfire Rebellion happened. So, yeah, this, that, was, that was an interesting point. And this is analogous in our own history when after feudalism, especially when feudalism started to become, when the fiefs started to become hereditary, these larger fiefs, these regional nobles that would hold larger fiefs would actually get, gain in, severe, in popularity. I mean, some like the Duke of Warwick was the kingmaker because he had so much power in, in the War of the Roses. So you actually get to see these powerful nobles starting to become you know, members of these factions where the king actually needs to pay attention to them. Whereas before you could just say, well, it doesn't matter. I have the dragon and you don't. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, yeah, the consent, the overwhelming consent of the governed, or at least the consent of the majority of the governed. Yeah. Uh, I can't think of an example in Westerosi history where factions developed and it didn't become big problems. Like the Dance of the Dragons was the Greens and the Blacks. And yeah. then yeah. we have the Blackfires, five generations of strife. Yep. Yep. And then and then in the modern, most modern times, Ares and Rhaegar, as we learned from the World of Ice and Fire, yep. there was actually quite a bit of factionalizing going yeah. on there yeah. before that all fell apart. But then when you got into that era, when you started after... Uh, Daron the second started to really quell quelled the first Blackfire rebellion. Then you started to have kind of a uh, an idea of Targaryen misrule. Bloodraven was violating the the rights of nobles nobles and commoners alike. He was refusing to protect the Starks and the Lannisters when Dagon Gravejoy decided to reave. Which one of the principal features of the, the monarchy was that you surrender a bit of your autonomy in exchange in for order protection for protection. the royal armies. Well, I mean, they're not they're not protecting us. Stark and Lannister had to go and make an alliance to go and fight off Dagon Greyjoy. Eventually, it says the dragons uh, couldn't beat the dragons, which I'm guessing is probably uh, fodder for another Duncan egg. I'm guessing yeah. is when that's going to happen. I would think so. But then you have, but then as the the keep beat the Reds keep beating the Blacks, but then you get to the War of the Nine Penny Kings, and then you actually see Jaharis the Second is too frail to even go on campaign. Uh, Ares the second goes on campaign, but he's quite eccentric. Whereas you see the regional nobles actually have a lot of power. Brynden Tully, Tywin Lannister, all of these famous nobles. Probably actually, I'm I'm of the belief that Lewin Martell actually cut his bones in the, the in timeline the, would make sense in, uh, yeah. in the Nine Penny Kings. So you see all of these great houses, and they're forming alliances together. As as it said, the the Tullys and the uh, the Baelishes. 
agreed to a fostridge when you know a veilman would never meet a riverlander out of any in any normal circumstance but here it was everybody bonding over the shared camaraderie of of um of the being in the war camp that's actually i mean i personally was or well you know I'm, i was i was in the military and i can tell you that there actually is such a thing as wartime fraternity among people you would never meet in normal life yep and uh, so they had to start, and that's when you started seeing, wait a minute, do we actually need a Targaryen mm-hmm. as the head of our faction? And that's when you got the Southern Southron Ambitions faction, which was a, a, an alliance of four of the most powerful nobles, which was at the time the Starks, the Aarons, the Baratheons, and the Tullys. Uh, Tywin Lannister, eventually, even Tywin Lannister noticed the power of that, tried to kind of backdoor his way in that. <laughs> uh, the Martells and the, the Martells over. and the Lannisters started to to kind of build a possibly a regional power, regional power block. Or my personal th- pet theory is that the Doran's mother recognized there's four powerful things. Luthor Tyrell is an idiot. The Greyjoys are untrustworthy. That leaves the Lannisters, and they're going to want the Lannisters because they have gold and they have good troops. If I get myself tied into them, then I make their position stronger, and that way when the Ty- when Tywin is negotiating to get into the South Run ambitions, I'm going to be right there at the table next to him, and we can st- negotiate for stronger uh, political power into that alliance as opposed to just making Rickard Stark the, f- the singular fulcrum of that alliance. Yeah, and there was, um, the, this is, like you said, this is all very gradual. They're all yep. starting to kind of realize that Targaryens, not only the Targaryens not necessarily needed in that sense, but they're not doing a great job. You have this string of kings who are just not very capable, or in the case of some of them, try to reform the realm in a yes. way that the nobles are really against. It might actually be a good way to reform the realm, but it got so much yeah. pushback. And that's, of course, in this case, we're talking about Aegon the Fifth, Egg, who tried to take a lot of power away from the lords, but... Yeah, expand he, the rights of the small folk. He yeah. was very victimized by... Uh, well, maybe victimized is the wrong word, but it, it, it worked out poorly because you have to have... One of the ways to make these things work is you have to have these alliances. And, of course, the most standard way to have these alliances is with marriages. Yep. And Aegon V tried to marry all his kids to important families and, and all they wanted to do was happened. marry each other <laughs> <laughs> they <laughs> all fell, all, all that just, fell yeah. apart for various reasons yeah. and yep. of all of the alliances he tried only one worked and that was yeah. to the lannisters because he uh, he, uh tywin squired squired in court yeah uh, but there was a mar- there was a proposed marriage with the tullys that didn't happen the tyrells and Tyrell, and that again this happen. is all like everything that was elena that... elena was going to marry um daron yeah. and daron was a uh, yeah. gay so he wasn't interested. Yeah. And uh, so it's funny when Olena says, I put a stop to that. It's like, mm, yeah. I, I don't say, think I you did. You, yeah. <laughs> and all of this. You really wanted that to stop. Yeah. <laughs> the, Neither of you really wanted that. And this is all still <laughs> happening. You know, all these, the, what we were just talking about now, all these alliances and factions and everything is all happening still while there is a Targaryen, in the last couple of Targaryens mm-hmm. are still in power. But again, it's just kind of going to show you that, you know, they've tried, they're still trying all these, the Targaryens, trying all these different methods of rule and are they working? Um, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the faction head works, but as long as the Targaryen is a member of the faction head. Right. When you finally get to Ares II and he goes and he murders his way through the feudal contract, mm-hmm. well, that sends the Southron Ambitions Alliance against him. But if if the king is just going to murder a senior lord without a right to trial, with no, no what's going to happen? The There's no reason for any of the nobles really to go and back the Targaryens at this point, because there's no sense that loyalty today is going to be repaid with loyalty tomorrow. And there's no threat, right? If Ares had dragons, he could have probably gotten away with a lot of what he did. But. One of the most interesting <laughs> questions I like to think about all of this is how much of this, if any of it, would have happened if dragons had not? Because like when you when the last dragon dies, it's about you know 150 some years into Targaryen yeah. rule, so it's still like relatively new, I guess. Mm-hmm. You know the the idea of of these. Um, well, they had about as dragons for as, as long in the monarchy as they they didn't have. Them. Right. Yeah. So yeah. it's clear that the monarchy can exist, but you don't have that overwhelming trump card. To the point, the Targaryens are a very weak feudal monarchy. They have very, relatively lo- uh, small levies in comparison to the large regional nobles like the Starks or the uh, Lannisters. Yeah, they don't have a lot of land. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Dragonstone is like the most fertile place on <laughs> Westeros. What are you talking about? <laughs> can't argue Man, with that. How, how can you... How, 
<laughs> yeah, how, to, how can you contend with the might of Cashley Rock when you have Duskendale? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and even even Duskendale doesn't really like you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So when that happens, <laughs> really the only the only members of the tar- of that support the uh, the uh, Targaryens in Robert's Rebellion are also themselves split by the Rhaegar and Ares faction. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the Martells are going to be supporting the Targaryens because they're married into the family and they have a direct, you know, they have a direct stake in the succession of Ares to Rhaegar and then to Aegon the Infant. Um, And then the Tyrells realize that they can actually, they depend upon the, the Targaryens for legitimacy because Aegon was the one who elevated them as Lord Paramount of the Mander over all of the other claim, all the other families with better blood claims. So they kind of have to believe in the Targaryens because the next king might say, you know what, you don't have a blood claim, and the Targaryens were the ones that established that, not me. <laughs> um, so those are the really the two large families that do that. Now, of course, Rhaegar, being very popular, uh, although con- somewhat aloof sort of uh, person, had his own personal ties, hence why the Mutons supported uh, the Targaryens and other other families supported them. So it was still a close-run thing, but in the end, uh, Robert Baratheon had a coalition of four lords paramount, eventually five, which is the largest coalition that really Westeros had ever seen since, I mean, since the Nine Penny Kings, really. And this time there was no Targaryen at the head of it. And when you have, you know, if the Targaryen monarchy is needs to be the champion of a powerful faction. When there's no powerful faction that's the champion of the Targaryen dynasty, they're kaput. And now, long live King Robert Baratheon. (laughs) And so now we have, we're coming back full circle. We have the potential for the realm might have to relearn its lessons. All these great and powerful lords who didn't live during the time of dragons and didn't realize how... Mm -hmm difficult it was to do, to fight against that or mm-hmm. a, about to see that again. Anyone who's not on Danny's side might be uh, learning that hard lesson. Yeah, mm-hmm. crispy, definitely. And even <laughs> so, even Cersei is really hasn't been learning the lessons of power because she keeps trying to undermine the Tyrell alliance. That's the powerful faction that's keeping their, them in power. <laughs> and the problem is, is that she believes that the Tyrells are a threat and to her own Lannister supremacy that, you know, she's not even learning the lessons of the the monarch as feudal uh, head. Tywin knew it. Tywin knew it very well because he was the one that joined the winning team. <laughs> so it seems that now this whole lesson of the monarchy as the head of the powerful feudal coalition is actually one that is relevant. And you might actually see that with Aegon the Sixth, with a coalition of the out, out and out reachers such as the Rowans and the Tarleys with the Martells. And that, friends that, in the Reach. At least that's mm-hmm. what it appears to be shaping up in with the um, with the sixth book. Yeah. So that might actually still be relevant, but there is still no real trump card to dragons at this point. Nope, um, not that we know of. Well, it seems, though, that <laughs> all these different kind of, you know, forms of government that the Targaryens were trying, um, I mean, I, I guess, would you say that it seems like the fa- the idea of the faction has yeah. been the one that kind of stuck around stuck around for better or for worse? Yeah. Yep. It, I mean, it was, it was their... War of Five Kings was kind of like a yeah. bunch of different factions. They weren't all, they weren't all against each other specifically, yep. but they, yeah. were fa- they were all factions. Well, that yeah. was actually what stopped the anti Lannis the... the, the Every side that was not Lannisters was the fact that they could not unite the way that they could under Robert Baratheon. Mm-hmm. If if the if Renly and Stannis and Rob all said, "Okay, we're all going to support one candidate," the Lannisters would have been toast. There would have been nothing they could have done. It's the same thing with this faction. The this faction. So the idea is with the Targaryen monarchy after the dragons, the best way to success was to be the head of the most powerful faction within the kingdom. Now, with eight different kingdoms, three different languages, three different faiths, <laughs> however many different subcultures, that's got, that's a tough thing to do. Yeah. yeah. Without, but with only ravens to communicate. But yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> it it was done. It was done by Robert. It was done by Jaharis the yep. second. It was done by Daron the second. So it can be done, but it's but, not easy. No. And will it will it be done? Yeah. No. So. They just everything might do, just be um, shredded. The <laughs> yeah, I think that's okay. the answer. There needs to be the human faction uh, in a while. Yeah, <laughs> open up some um, we Yeah, we've we've gone over a lot of information, so thank you guys for mm-hmm. listening. Um, yeah, but yeah, let's. Minutes. We've got ten minutes. Yeah, we've got about ten minutes left. So questions? Ooh, love it! I see hands. Um, that gentleman on the end there. Isn't part of the issue with that kind of factionalism the fact that 
not only do you have to be head of a faction, but you have to be head of a faction that wins by trying to support that system mm -hmm. and especially to self-actualize that system. Kind of seems like you're just in roulette putting everything on black every single time. Well, the, dice, huh? the idea. How do you expect that to last? So the idea. Well, I mean, you, there's a way to do that, especially with the king as the sole benefactor and largess of, especially land. That is one way uh, kings were expected to be open-handed. You actually see this in the books. Uh, you know, all of these be all of these great kings, they're so open-handed. I mean, even, even, away, the, even yeah, the worst of them, Euron, everyone says, oh, wow, look how open-handed Euron is. Rags and rocks, he calls them. And even Stannis is ever, like on the other end of the spectrum. Stannis is yeah. like, well, I got to be open-handed. That's just how it is. Yeah. yeah. He doesn't like the people that he's being open-handed to, but uh, he does it anyway. Yeah. Um, and you de you, so you can definitely see the, uh, the idea. But yes, if you've ever played CK2, managing factions is really difficult. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that's that's the idea. And also you can try to find ways to make sure to divide factions against each other, especially if fa for factions with divergent ends. If they're feuding against each other and you're still in charge, then you actually have a lot of relative there's, power. There's always a weakness that you can exploit. I yeah. mean, I yeah. would think so anyway. You know? Along with the other symbols of power, such as being anointed by the high septon, so to transgress against the king is to transgress against the seven. There's, you know, there's, there's yeah. things like that. You always have these symbols that of, of legitimacy, especially, like I said, in preliterate societies where the idea of governance is really personal, like in feudalism. Well, I, guess, yeah. I guess that's what I'm really getting at. Because like yep. the, the head of the church, you know, the gods aren't going to be able to fight. Just like you can fight the dragons. Yep. Like the gods are a different trump card. But, but unfortunately... Unfortunately, Baylor said that, well, I'm going to do whatever I want, including naming this eight-year-old boy High Septon. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, go that's going to go, you know, rankle the most of that, that long, because well. one of them wants to be High Septon. <laughs> yeah. Let's take a next. Who's next? Another question? Go on this. Uh, yes. Red, red shirt. Yeah. And then we'll... Targaryen shirt. Targaryen shirt. That's, yes. Yes. that's a Blackfire shirt. Oh, right. that is a Blackfire black shirt. shirt. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Reverse color. Red or black? Come on, Steve. That's a dangerous question, even Come now. Come on. <laughs> So, anyway, Blackfire shirt. So, you know, like leading up to the Dance of the Dragons, nobody's fighting the Targaryen. Right. Nobody's touching. Largely. Unless no. it's another Targaryen. Magor and, yeah. Magor and Jaharis, yeah. 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 The only way that that was torn apart was by another Targaryen with dragons. So, mm -hmm. why, and given that, you know, dragon genders mm -hmm. are fluid, mm -hmm. why is no one telling Danny to have her dragons locked in a room with each other? <laughs> <laughs> um, well,. There, it, I think I think the strategic imperative of her actually going to Westeros to try and conquer the the kingdom is probably the big thing. She has a lot of stuff going on in her chap. She doesn't really have time to say, "Hey, dragons, go get busy." There's some evidence that is happening in uh, in the in, da in the uh, in the pit. The two yep. the Viserion and Rhaegal. It appears that Viserion was kind of carving out like a little spot, uh, like yeah. carving yeah, through like the a, rock. Like a and, yeah. and the, the carving out of the rock up there was more. It may have been the nesting behavior. It's, and it's, that does theory. sound like that does sound like nesting behavior. Yeah, it's not. It's and by something no else. Means certain, but it's George threw that detail in there for a reason. Mm -hmm. I just thought you know, like you have Barris and Selmy coming in there, and they're all talking. Yeah. Like short term yeah. battle planning, but yeah. they're not like, all right, here's the only way that you're gonna secure your. Danny needs to figure out how people are going to tame and ride them. Yeah, before. yeah. She more I think of them, that, I that is think another too. big thing is that you, you know, there's no real sense in having hatchlings unless you have people that can control them. Yeah, she's already one out, of my favorite out there killing what if kids things. And things and stealing sheep and stuff. So it's yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite things to think about is you know, so Danny has three dragons still in the well, yeah. um, but in the books. <laughs> in the books. Um, so what happens when? So let's say that she takes the throne, um, and let's say that I mean it took 150 some years for for more dragons to hatch. Yeah. I mean, let's say that these three are kind of like the, no more come after them, or very few come after them. So Danny might find herself in the same situation yeah, as kick, some of her kick, forebears. Kick, you She's a Targaryen can, on the throne the the with yep. no dragons. So I'm just <laughs> yeah. So that's that's always been interesting to me, but we'll see. So uh, let's. Oh. Yeah. yeah, somebody else pick. Yeah, uh, I've done enough picking. Targaryen rule. Did they ever face White Walkers, or did the Wall always? Keep no, the no. The um, the, the others, wall the others were never, were never a factor yeah. uh, in in the history of the Targaryens. Winter actually attacked Targaryens. Uh, I mean, the same. I think the same way that the normal normal way, just long seasons of of low growing, uh, especially in the north. Um, you actually did have, like, for example, Aegon the Fifth did have to send supply shipments yeah. to the north. 
Um, but there was never any uh, supernatural winters. Yeah, the they kind, never the kind experienced we're, the... we're going to be seeing in the sixth yeah, book. Just really we bad had ones. Bad yeah. winters. Right but at this the, is going to make them. Right at the end of the Dance of the Dragons, as it was winding down, there was a five or six year winter that started, and it was really yeah. bad. So that was a great way to kick off. Great way to kick off. The realm gets torn apart by war, and then they have this that comes, and yeah. then. Uh, this about a hundred years later, the same thing happened. There was a really nasty winter, right when um, Aegon the Fifth became king, right when the Blood Raven was sent to the Wall, and uh, the Black Fires made their last shot right after that. We've got someone in scale mail over there with a question. Well, scale mail. Okay. Yep. okay. Well, it looks like scale mail. <laughs> oh, that's mo- that's it's more monetary, isn't that? Oh, okay. There we go. Oh, there we go. Here you stand, Ma- Mage Mormon. Here you stand. <laughs> a, a long back question: Have any of the tales of the Targaryens been dragons? Never winter was starting, just kind yeah, of getting I cold. Don't. Yeah, uh, I don't think any of them have actually ever ranged north of the wall in the winter. Um, uh, well, she, they, she visited, but that was not during the winter. Yeah. Uh, but yes, uh, Alisan and Jaharis uh, specifically were mentioned that they um, Jaharis uh, actually fought north of the wall, but it was not said what, when that was, and that may have just been a story to excite children. So yeah. How are the dragons going to react to the winter that the others are bringing? That is, that is a, a, difficult, a difficult question. Unfortunately, um, with the sole exception of there being mentioned ice dragons at some point uh, in the actual cosmology of the setting. we have, I think George has specifically kept that in the dark so that he can surprise us with the revelation. Yeah, yeah that's a tough question. It's a m- much debated question, but yeah, we don't, we don't have a direct answer. I think it will be problematic. The others will be a problem for the dragons and vice versa. Yeah. I think both of those extremes, they can't, neither can cooperate, obviously, and uh, they're both uh, yeah. uh, the antithesis of the other, so it seems like there'll be some... Violence. <laughs> well, Westeros does have does, does have that consent of the governed. This the idea that I've, I've always mentioned is that in Mar- tar- uh, monarchs in Westeros have to have the claim. That's their justification for kingship. But they also have to have a claim, the willingness of the vassals to follow. Mm-hmm. So, and you definitely saw that with uh, Robert Baratheon when he, he says he's showing himself fulfilling the roles of a king. Was yeah. his what was his name? Lord the in the uh, in the the all the sisters the the lord that talks to to um the, oh um yeah. yeah the lord that talks to Ned. Roderick Burrell yeah Roderick oh, Burrell okay. yeah, says he fights the way a king should fight so <laughs> saw him fight at Galtown yeah. so what yeah. you sixteen so what you need <laughs> so what you actually need is to in order to get that acclaim what you need to do it's kind of weird you have to put say you're a, a king and then act as a king should and then the vassals say you can be our king it's this kind of this symbiotic relationship of claim and a claim. Well, and Robert too was like, you know, because he wanted to kind of depose the Targaryens also for personal reasons, but he had a really strong oh, yeah, personal really story. Like Rhaegar stole my my beloved, yeah. you know. So and he then kind of and then Ares tried to Rhaegar murder him. Yeah, yeah. Really yeah. Like wow. <laughs> Well, I think that was actually yeah. more, more of a line of what what elevates him over, say, John Aaron, yeah. or or uh, Ned, Eddard Stark. Which I mean, yeah. Eddard Stark wouldn't have never been because he full worships the old gods. But you yeah. know, that's that's yeah. a t- topic for another point, a time. Yeah. But so it, it is all about, really, it is about the willingness of the vassals, that acclaim, that powerful acclaim. And Robert had that the magic. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Last one right here. Uh, down here in front. Kind of what there is they can get everyone to believe obviously about the others and all that stuff yeah but isn't that kind of what she can use towards that because if she can convince hey i've got dragons and mm-hmm. we've got the supernatural threat if we can get people to believe that right mm-hmm. you can get people to unite and believe that you you have the tool to yeah, defeat absolutely, the, the ultimate evil. Yeah, actually, that's a great point. It, it, yeah. it is yeah. possible, but unfortunately, you have to make them first believe that there are Snarks and Grumpkins in the North. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> eventually, it'll be so obvious that they can't, yeah. like, oh, the yeah. North is overrun. Yeah. Might eventually actually get that. Yeah, yeah. If, they're, if they're, like, attacking the Trident, people are going to believe yeah. by then. Yeah. 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 All right, guys, that's our time for okay. our panel. Thank yep. you so much we'll for being here. We'll still be around if you have any further questions. Thank you. But uh, I do believe we have to cede the, uh, the room to someone else. Yes. So. All right. <laughs>